Okay, welcome to this new study of medical knowledge and its limits. So in this study, what I will be doing is going through two fairly recent books and some articles relating to um, medical knowledge and the limits of medical knowledge. So let's go ahead and jump into this study. So the first book that we're going to work through is Jeremy Howick's book, Evidence-Based Medicine. Dr. Jeremy Howick is a research fellow with the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine in the Department of Primary Care Health Sciences, a senior research associate in Faculty of Philosophy and fellow of Kellogg College at Oxford University. Dr. Howick has provided a valuable book in his 2011 book, The Philosophy of Evidence-Based Medicine. The main goal of his book is to argue that evidence-based medicine, otherwise known as EPM, ought to be used to evaluate the effectiveness of medical interventions. So it's helpful to have a little bit of background on how, in the history of medicine, treatment has been deemed effective. There are three broad views of how, or three broad ways in which treatment is deemed effective. One is to just look at observational differences. This can be done um, not on the basis of any detailed study, but just on the basis of, you know, observing the fact that people who undergo go certain experiences or eat certain foods have different outcomes. So one of the classic examples of this is the discovery that eating citrus on long voyages um, prevented scurvy. So at the time in the 17th and 18th century, they didn't understand you know, anything about vitamin C and its role in preventing scurvy. They just knew that if you carried citrus fruit on long voyages, uh, sailors didn't get scurvy. So they had no idea about the causal mechanism here, but they could just see the observational differences. Right, so in this case, right, treatment is deemed effective just by looking at the observational differences. Another way to think about how treatment may be deemed effective is causal, identifying the relevant causal mechanisms. Right, so um, you might think proposing a particular kind of surgery right, would, would heal an ailment even though you haven't observed any differences. It's a novel surgery. But your understanding of the relevant causal mechanisms right, would enable you to come to view that the treatment is effective. Another way in which treatment is deemed effective is expert judgment. Here you rely on the judgment of an experienced physician to come to right, indicate by testimony that a treatment is deemed effective. Now, it's interesting, as we'll see in the course of this study, that EPM, evidence-based medicine tends to the direction of empiricism to just look at the relevant observational differences. And there are a couple reasons for this that we'll uncover as we go through this study. One is that causal, identifying the relevant causal mechanisms can be very difficult given the complexity of human physiology. So we might identify a particular causal path, but there are a lot of other relevant causal paths, right? So this is akin to thinking, you know, that if I were to light a flame, right, I could start a fire, but that neglects the fact that we have to have a lot of other, you know, conditions present. We have to have a flammable material, we have oxygen present, right, in the environment. It has to be the case that, um, you know, we can start, uh, and, you know, and, and so on. Right. Expert judgment is also fallible. The history of medicine is replete with examples in which experts right, claimed that a certain treatment was effective when in fact it wasn't. And we'll see you know, examples of this as we go through the course, as we go through the study. Okay, so as Howick notes, evidence-based medicine is claimed to be a new paradigm. So it was started in a series of articles in the, you know, in the late 70s and early 80s. There are three crucial claims to evidence-based medicine, and what Howick does is provide in his, in his book, Howick provides this nice simplified uh, evidential hierarchy. You see here this pyramid, right, with randomized control trials at the top, above observational studies, and above um, expert judgment and mechanistic reasoning. The pyramid is supposed to represent that the highest quality evidence comes from randomized trials. And this is, in fact, what these three claims that Howick gives amount to. So he says, here are three claims uh, that are crucial for evidence-based medicine. The first one is that randomized controlled trials, otherwise known as RCTs, are systematic reviews of many randomized trials, generally offer stronger evidential support than observational studies. Right? The systematic reviews of randomized trials are known as meta-analyses. Right? And the thought here is that if you want the very best evidence that a treatment is to be effective, you need to subject it to randomized controlled trials. And if you see crucial differences between the experimental group and the control group in those randomized control trials, then you have excellent evidence that uh, this treatment is, in fact, effective. A second thesis of evidence-based medicine is that comparative clinical studies in general, including both RCTs and observational studies, offer, offer 
stronger evidential support than mechanistic reasoning from more basic sciences. This again goes back to worries about mechanistic reasoning in the context of very complex causal systems that we can often identify, correctly identify a causal path, but neglect all the other influences that are operative in the system. And then there are just clear cases in which mechanistic reasoning doesn't even identify a relevant causal path. The third claim of evidence-based medicine is that comparative clinical studies in general offer stronger evidential support than expert clinical judgment. So these three claims, how it identifies as crucial to evidence-based medicine, and what we want to do in this study on medical knowledge and its limits is look at those three claims and see to what extent they are defensible. Okay, so here's the plan for Howick's book. He identifies some problems with evidence-based medicine. I'll just mention two here, is that uh, one of the puzzles with evidence-based medicine is that we know certain treatments are in fact valid. Um, there is a famous article about the use of parachutes not being subject to randomized controlled trials, and that's just to indicate that, you know, look, you know, we understand in some cases certain kinds of treatments are perfectly effective and that we do not need to subject these to randomized controlled trials. And so the question is, how does an evidence-based medicine advocate respond to that sort of thing, where the highest evidence is supposed to be one that comes from randomized controlled trials. Another problem that Howick mentions with evidence-based medicine is that the hierarchy itself, the three claims, aren't themselves supported by randomized controlled trials, but they're supported by something like expert judgment, he says. Right, so an evidence-based medicine advocate will want to respond to these. So Howick's book is aimed to defend evidence-based medicine against these and other charges, and he's going to focus the defense on evidence-based medicine on the three claims given above. So in his book, part two is going to defend claim one, right, that randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses of these are in some sense or another the uh, best kind of evidence that one can have for deeming that a medical treatment is effective, and then in part two, or part three, he's going to defend claims two and three. All right, so let's turn to the introduction of Medical Nihilism, this excellent book by Jacobs de Genga. So remember, this is an introduction to the issues that we're going to talk about. What we are talking about in this introductory lecture is the perspectives of Howick and the perspective of Stigenga. We're going to continue our study of Howick, and then we're going to look in more detail at Stigenga's excellent book, Medical Nihilism. So Jacob Stigenga is a reader in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. He has two excellent books that are recently out, Medical Nihilism, which is the one we're currently focusing on, and Care and Cure, an introduction to the philosophy of medicine. Medical Nihilism is the view that we should have little confidence in the effectiveness of medical interventions. Now I remember when I was first reading this several years ago when the book first came out, that can be kind of, that can be shocking because we tend to think that medical interventions are effective as a rule, and it's only in the rare cases that they are not effective. He continues later on to explain that given right, that the highest value of medicine is the elimination of symptoms of disease, and ideally the elimination of the disease itself, and thereby the achievement of health, medical nihilism holds that this value very often cannot be realized, and confidence in medical interventions typically lacks objective standing. So I think a common way to push back on this claim initially right, is to think that, look, medicine has made incredible advancements. We have eradicated smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, and so on. Every of antibiotics is a watershed moment in the history of medicine. Cancer treatment has vastly improved over the years. Cancer treatment has improved vastly over the years. There's, you know, with the discovery of antibiotics in the early part of the 20th century, there was a movement to try to discover the cure of cancer, and they discovered that cancer wasn't just one disease, but many different kinds of diseases all coming under a common um, under a common name and having sort of uh, similar uh, features to it. But nonetheless, over the past 80 years, cancer treatment has vastly improved. To mention another example, coronary bypass surgery is an incredibly difficult and complex surgery that extends lives. Medicine has made some very significant strides, so Jacob is not um, arguing that medicine as a whole is one that we can't have any confidence in medical treatments. Rather, right, his, his view is that if we look at medicine, medical interventions, as you might think of as a giant pie, there's only a small slice of which where we have sufficient evidence that medicine does in fact, that these medical interventions are in fact um, um, successful. Right, so he points to uh, many non-communicable diseases that have no cures, Parkinson's, anxiety, depression, various auto 
immune disorders, and so on. He also points to the fact that, you know, big pharma, as it's known, pushes various drugs that have, at most, uh, limited effects. So think of SSRIs that are used to treat anxiety and depression. These have, you know, very uh, uh, limited um, effects in treating anxiety and depression. Uh, he mentions as well statins and drugs for type 2 diabetes. And as we go through this study, we'll look at more examples. Okay, so let's think about how the argument goes for Stegenga's claim that we should have little confidence in medical interventions. So he wants to focus his argument on the method of medical research, right? And he says the method itself will generate an argument for medical nihilism, right? So he is going to raise worries about uh, the use of randomized control trials and meta-analyses. So this is going to be especially interesting to look at after we look at Howick's defense of EPM. So Stiganga gives two lines of arguments. The first is that medical research itself is malleable. He says the design, execution, analysis, interpretation, publication, and marketing of medical studies involves numerous fine-grained choices, and such choices are open to being made in a variety of ways. And these decisions influence what is taken to be the pertinent evidence regarding a medical intervention under investigation. We'll look at details of this as we turn to his book later on in our study. The second line of argument is that there are huge financial incentives to produce a quote-unquote effective treatment. And given the malleability of such methods, that produces a bending of the data to show quote-unquote effectiveness when the treatment is not effective. Right? So it's a combination of the malleability of the methods. There are a number of choice points that one um, can make. And in that context, right, you have huge financial pressure to show that the treatment is effective. So to show that you want to so the idea is that a researcher or, you know, that, that idea is that a researcher is going to be under significant pressure to choose certain choice points that indicate that a medicine is in fact effective when in fact it may not be effective. So Stiganga is clear that he's arguing for a general kind of medical skepticism, not a local skepticism. So this isn't a skepticism about a particular type of medical treatment. So he's not arguing, for example, that statins in particular, right, are ones that we lack sufficient. Um, justification for thinking that they're effective. Rather, what he's arguing for is a kind of general medical skepticism based upon the methods that are in fact employed and right, the situation that medicine finds itself in currently. So we can compare this to a claim that we lack any kind of inductive knowledge with a claim that we don't know what the stock market will do tomorrow. Right. So the argument that we lack any kind of inductive knowledge is a general skeptical argument. One of the most famous forms of this is Hume's argument for skepticism. So Hume thinks that um, our knowledge from induction relies on the principle that nature is uniform. Any attempt to justify the principle that nature is uniform itself requires the principle that nature is uniform, and so there's no non-circular justification for um, the claim that, for example, the unobserved cases will resemble the observed cases. And so we get this general kind of argument for, in for uh, inductive skepticism. You could still think that you don't know what the stock market's going to do tomorrow without being a general inductive skeptic. Right. So what Jacob says about this, uh, about the more general um, claim of medical nihilism, is he says medical nihilism is a more general stance. It may be true that medical interventions ought to be assessed empirically on a case-by-case -case basis. However, such assessments ought to be construed broadly to include the frequency of failed medical interventions, the extent of misleading and discordant evidence in medical research, the sketchy theoretical framework on which many medical interventions are based, and the malleability of even the very best empirical methods employed to warrant causal hypotheses in medicine. So now we want to turn to a brief overview of Bayes' theorem. This is going to be important for understanding Jacob's overall argument, <coughs> but it's also important in general to um, understand inference. <coughs> okay, so let's take a look at Bayes' theorem. All right, so we want to start out over here with, um, I guess what we can do is we can look at this equation. What we see here is that a particular quantity is equal um, <coughs> over here to this fraction, and we want to understand this. So Bayes' theorem begins with what's over here on the left-hand side. This is known as the posterior probability of a hypothesis. And what we see is we see here that the probability of H, given this line here indicates that you're assuming that the thing to the right of that is true, the probability of H given a particular observation. And so what we want to know is what is the value of this probability? 
if we're thinking about a particular example, we might think of a woman in her 40s who undergoes routine scanning for breast cancer and, we, and she receives a positive test. And we might want to know, well, what's the probability that this particular woman uh, has breast cancer given a positive test? And the cool thing about Bayes' theorem is that it relates that to other probabilities that we can often determine um, on the basis of testing, on the basis of knowledge of tests, and on the basis of you know, known, um, the known prevalence of a disease in a population. So what Bayes' theorem says is that the probability of H given O is equal to this fraction of probabilities. In the numerator here, uh, let's start with this probability here, the probability of H. This is known as the prior probability of H. In the example that we're going to work through, this is the prevalence of breast cancer in the general population of women in their 40s. The probability that is next to the prior probability, this is known as the likelihood of H. This is the probability of an observation given that the hypothesis is true. In our example, this would be the probability that a woman in their 40s right, receives a positive test given that they do in fact have um, cancer. All right. Now, these probabilities are multiplied together. Sometimes we speak of the probability of a positive observation given the hypothesis being weighted by the probability of the hypothesis. Right? In, the, um, in the denominator, we have the probability of O. This is known as the unconditional probability of the observation. And there's a very helpful rule for expanding this probability out, known as the theorem of total probability. Down here, right, we do have the theorem of total probability, which tells you that the probability of O is equal to the sum of two probabilities. It's equal to the probability of H multiplied by the probability of O given H, and that is of course added to the probability of not H given the probability of O um, given not H. One way I think about this is uh, we want to know how likely this particular observation is, and we can think of dividing the world into two cases. Right? Let's just think about the particular case. We want to know how likely it, it <coughs> how likely is it to receive a positive test uh, of, of breast cancer, and we can think of you know the world being one way in which you're testing um, among people that don't have cancer, and the other way you're testing among people that um, in fact have cancer. And we want to know what's the probability of getting a positive test given that you don't have cancer, and what's the probability of getting of getting a positive test given that you do have cancer. And then we weight those by the respective probabilities that the person has cancer and they don't have cancer and we add those together and that gives us right, this uh, general probability of this observation. So let's work this through in a particular example. Here we're going to work through this example that we've been talking about already. So we're going to know what's the probability that a woman in her 40s has breast cancer given a positive test. We start off with the uh, prevalence of cancer in the relevant population. These numbers are toy numbers that make no claim to the accuracy of these numbers. So let's say that the probability of cancer in the relevant population is one in a thousand. So what that means is that, on average, right, if we have, if we take a, a thousand uh, women in their 40s, that one of them would be found to have um, breast cancer. This is a claim that, on average, right, is true. So the second is, what's the power of the test to indicate cancer if cancer is indeed present? And we can imagine that this particular test, right, is quite powerful to detect cancer if it's present. So we can say that it's 99% accurate. Uh, so this means that the uh, female who has cancer, uh, 99 out of 100 times, will be tested positive. Then a third probability that we need to know is what's the power of the test to detect the absence of cancer if there's no cancer. So here we want to know what's the probability of getting a negative test, a test that says, no, this individual doesn't have cancer, um, if in fact they don't have cancer. Right? So this probability, the probability of not T, given the probability of um, the person doesn't have cancer, we can say is 99% or 95, excuse me, 95% accurate. So then, if we want to determine the particular probability that a female in their 40s who tests positive has breast cancer, we can use Bayes' theorem. So here what we need to do is we need to do two things. Um, we need to first figure out the general probability of testing positive, whether or not, depending on which population you come from, right? So here we're looking at um, the here we're looking at the denominator in Bayes' theorem, right? So we, we will have here the probability of t, right? And remember that the probability of t, right, is the sum of two weighted um, probabilities. So the probability that a person has cancer, um, probability that the person doesn't have cancer, and the probability that a person has cancer over here, weighted by the probability that they would test positive given that they have cancer, um, and over here the probability that they would test positive given that they don't have cancer, all right?
So given the um, values that we gave above, we can figure this out fairly easily, right? So the probability of a positive test given that a neutral has cancer is, is um, 0.99 um, times the probability that the individual chosen at random in the population right, has cancer, one out of 1,000. And we're going to add that to the probability um, that a person uh, tests positive given that they don't have cancer. Now notice up here we gave the probability that the person doesn't test positive. So they receive a negative negative uh, test indicating that they don't have cancer. Right? That's 95% uh, um, accurate. So that would mean that the probability that they do receive what is in fact a false negative um, is 5% is, is, um, uh, 5 or 0 0.5. We're going to multiply that by 0.999, and then you just you know plug it into a calculator, and you get this result. So what that means is that in a general population, the probability of receiving a positive um, test is about five percent. All right. So then we use Bayes' theorem, right, and we see once we do this calculation that there's approximately a two percent chance that a woman in their 40s who receives a positive test in fact has breast cancer. So this is really important. Um, this is uh, related to um, you know, the um, <clears throat> base rate fallacy. So if you give this test to many practicing physicians, right, they tend to go with the relevant power of the test and think that, you know, it's overwhelmingly likely that this individual has breast cancer, but what they're doing is they're neglecting, right, the relevant population, right, uh, the prevalence of the disease in the relevant population. So this is a very helpful example. This is something that I indicate, you know, that I teach all my pre-med students when we go through. You know, hopefully none of them will com commit the base rate fallacy, but it is a very common uh, fallacy uh, to um, commit. Okay, so let's let's think about Stiganga's um, overall argument here. Right, so this is the master argument for medical nihilism. It's a Bayesian argument. He's going to argue that uh, the confidence that we should have that medical treatment is effective given evidence of it its effectiveness is quite low. So here, where H is the, is the claim that a medical treatment is effective and E is evidence for its effectiveness, that the probability of H given E is quite low. And he's going to argue for this on the basis of three premises. The first premise is that the prior probability, the probability that a treatment is in fact effective, is quite low. The second claim is that the likelihood of the evidence, given the hypothesis of effectiveness, is quite low. So the probability that um, we would have evidence that a treatment is effective given right, that, in fact, the treatment is effective is quite low. And the third premise is that the probability that we would have evidence of effectiveness is in itself quite high. Right? So this is a nice little uh, Bayesian sort of mathematical argument. So if this probability is high, these two probabilities are low, right, then this probability right, itself is going to be low. The way Jacob approaches this issue is he says, look, you know, if you look at the way medicine is, in fact, prescribed, um, we are, in fact, prescribing um, to tens of millions of people um, medical treatments that aren't, that aren't, in fact, effective, which seems to indicate that we do have misplaced confidence in the effectiveness of medical interventions. So here are some, you know, examples. Um, up here, you know, SSRIs are prescribed right in the tens of millions, generating billions of dollars of revenue. Uh, drugs to lower cholesterol themselves generate, you know, incredible amounts of money. Um, surveys, you know, indicating relevant confidence in the power of medicine to um, cure almost any illness, overwhelmingly indicates that people are um, confident that medicine does have the power to cure any ailment. And then there is the uh, there's the marketing strategy of big pharma to indicate that. There is a pill for every ill. Um, there's an excellent book, which I'll put on the next slide, um, about Big Pharma, which indicates there are, in some cases, attempts to create illnesses because they have pills uh, that uh, they need to sell, and so they can create, um, um, they can create a medically defined um, condition right, in an effort to uh, have a pill for that. So, you know, there's the famous appeal for every ill, and less well-known is this uh, more malicious uh, marketing uh, campaign and ill for every pill. So this does seem to indicate that our confidence in medicine is uh, quite high and often misplaced. Stiganga goes through a brief history of medical nihilism. I'm not going to cover this um, in, in much detail. There are just three common threads throughout the history of medical nihilism. Medical nihilism, by the way, is also known as therapeutic nihilism. 
Um, the three common threads or themes are that many diseases themselves are untreatable, many medical interventions are ineffective, even dangerous. So of course here is a uh, famous picture of, um, of bloodletting, right, which um, when an individual was sick there was an attempt to um, get rid of the bad blood. This was based on you know, the humoral theory of medicine, um, that there was a, um, you know, an imbalance of humors in the body, and that you know, the attempt to uh, get rid of some of these bad humors. Of course, this was, you know, given our current medical knowledge, we know was an incredibly ineffective, often dangerous treatment. Another common theme in the history of medical nihilism is just the corrupting influence of um, money in medicine. So there's a famous quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., uh, who says that if the whole materia medica, as is now used, could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. So a common response to medical nihilism is that, look, today's different. Uh, we discovered, you know, certain antibiotics, which are, in a way, magic bullets for communicable diseases. Uh, we've eradicated smallpox, for example, and this is an incredibly good thing. Right, so Stegenga uh, notes that one way the today's different response could counter these recent articulations of medical nihilism is to claim that we now have a proper application of the scientific method to test medical interventions. There are many more effective medical interventions available to us, and these medical interventions are guaranteed to be safe and effective by diligent government regulation. So EPM is one, in fact, movement. And so what we're going to see as we continue this study is how the case for medical nihilism can be made um, given right, the today is different response and given right, the rise of evidence-based medicine. So I want to end here just with an overview of the key arguments of Stegenga's claims. Right, so he's going to argue that there are few magic bullets in medicine. So he's going to argue in the next chapter, which we'll look at um, in um, probably about seven or eight studies down the line, uh, medical interventions should target either the constitutive causal basis of a disease or target the harms caused by the disease. Ideally, uh, medical intervention should target both. But that the magic bullet model of medicine um, represents the noble idea that medicine, medical intervention should be specific and effective. Here the key cases are penicillin right, and insulin. But it's going to claim that in fact right, we, we lack medicine uh, that does this in the vast majority of cases. Second claim is the one we've seen already, is that contemporary research, medical, uh, contemporary research methods are malleable. Right? So there's a lot of different analytic choices, choices about instruments, uh, challenges to extrapolating the data. Right, which we'll see uh, that raises serious epistemic questions about um, what these methods, in fact, indicate. And then uh, he's going to look at harm, harms, bias, and fraud uh, in medicine and argue that it's quite prevalent. The overall master argument is that right, each particular chapter, which we'll look at later, right, reveals that we should have relatively low confidence and the effectiveness, uh, the effectiveness of medical interventions. Right. And so those are the key arguments that we'll look at later on in our study. I said I wanted to point out again this excellent book, Elizabeth Rosenthal, An American Sickness. And this in, goes into detail about the business aspect of medicine in contemporary America and how it has led to very many excesses and situations that I think we would all want to avoid. We will pick up with the study of Halleck's book in the next several lectures.